audiobook titled The Dragon of Dreams 267-276 by Commander 843. Chapter 267. A New Scar. Early Evening Midsummer. The Ancient Wreckage, Southwestern Holy Kingdom. Tap app tap app tap app the echo of my footsteps could be heard as I walked out of the gate of the crawler. It had been a couple hours since I finished exploring the shelter at that point, but I had been far from idle. Before turning off the reactor, I gave the workshop one last look through and relocated several of the more interesting items, like a handheld rail gun and carbon 3D printer, to the living quarters, before finally having Elios move several kilometers up the mountain with the elder. After heading back down to the crawler, I finally shut down the reactor and ensured that a new hot core was in place before finally doing a bit of cleanup and beginning the final preparations for moving the crawler. For starters, everything inside the gate room was moved into the cave, from the piles of corrosion that used to be machines to mounds of organic material, loose tiles, and anything else that could move or lead to more deterioration in the future. But as I worked on that, all the cables leading to the other areas of the shelter were disconnected. The wall of the crawler that was welded to the wall of the shelter was broken free, and most importantly, everything in regards to power and the reactor was made airtight. That stuff alone took about two hours, but after finishing them, I only had one thing left. The legs are already severely corroded, so they should break off when I pull on it. All that's left is to create an exit. Currently, the dungeon had a main entrance only about 10 meters in diameter, far from big enough to fit the crawler through, but at the same time, couldn't be enlarged with any ease as it was a slow taper over several kilometers. Another option I had was to bring it through the void, but that came with an extensive list of risks that I didn't want to take. I still need to experiment more with vector compression, but regardless, this will definitely be the safest route. Flash vroom splash the pool of water splashed as I changed to my dragon form and walked out through it. It wasn't actually all that deep, maybe about 4 meters at the deepest point, but it was still just enough for what I wanted to use it for. Blub splash crash splash standing at the deepest point of the puddle. I used quite a bit of magic to ever so carefully move the water behind me, toward the crawler, before lifting it up to form a wall covering an entirety of the cave like a plug. That should be good. In short, it was a plug that would prevent the Centicomb's surge of heat and air pressure from causing any damage to the crawler. It's unfortunate that I can't just use vacuum magic for this, but I don't think it'll be enough. Hopefully, this should be fine. Not wanting to continue to waste more of my limited mana by holding up the wall of water, I dug my claws into the stone and started preparing the spell. I needed something that could bore a sizable hole through a tremendous amount of rock while not causing any damage to the surrounding area or causing the cave to collapse. But while those were some big demands, I had just the spell. Let's see what the limit of Elios's magic is. VWWOM to be frank, this spell was so man expensive on this kind of scale that it was incredibly not worth using. The cost of energizing photons to such an extreme degree while simultaneously accumulating more of them beat out any other spell I had ever used by a long shot. It was actually so expensive that even though I had a little under a fifth of my reserve available, I was worried. After this, I won't have a whole lot of mana left, but at least I can use it as an excuse to crash at home. TSSSSS some of the water in the wall started to boil as the air around me heated up. All right, let's start small hole, then make it bigger. Scrackle the instant I looked up and opened my mouth. A thin beam, barely larger than a pencil, pierced through the top of the cave. But it didn't stay thin for long. Crackle hum rakarrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrr
depths above the noise of water boiling and molten rock dripping off the ceiling filled the air as I looked up through the massive glowing molten hole above me. Huh. Fudge quickly letting out a slightly strained breath. I released the wall of water and let it splash down onto the molten ground. Blood spopsis. But almost immediately, the scent of molten rock and iron was overpowered by something. Sniff huh? It was an odd scent, but it wasn't bad. Is it coming from those? Leaning down toward the basilisk eggs floating by my feet, I took a quick sniff and had the scent punch my nose. Hoof. It smelled like nothing I had ever experienced, being somewhere between steak and sushi, with a spicy scent between horseradish and an extremely hot pepper. It honestly smelled kind of good. Did the eggs get boiled during my spell? Leaning down again, I gave them a slightly closer look and contemplated what to do. But the next thing I knew, my mouth was watering, and a purely instinctual thought rang through my mind. I wonder what they taste like. It had been so long since I had actually eaten anything that, the moment I smelled something decent, I craved it. Uh, it's not like it'll hurt. Crunch the brittle shell shattered as I crushed it with my tongue, releasing an incredible wave of spice through my mouth. It was on a completely different level of heat from any pepper or spices I had tried during my time traveling across the western continent, but it was delicious. I'm not sure what that flavor is, but damn, is it good. It was a pleasant surprise that refreshed my energy and motivation after burning off such a tremendous amount of mana. I guess it can't hurt to relax for a minute. I need to let things cool off a bit anyways, right? After glancing up at the nearly 45 meter wide molten hole I had created, I plopped down into the pool of boiling water with a smile of satisfaction. S-B-L-S-H-T-S-S-S-S, but something was missing. Hmm. I wonder if Elios would like one. The evening sun quickly set below the horizon after that. I ended up bringing the eggs outside to watch the sunset while sharing them with Elios before eventually heading back into the cave to make some last minute modifications to the Crawler. After using Elios' spell, I no longer had enough mana and aura to comfortably carry the crawler with, while also using any form of thruster magic and vacuum magic, so I had to do things the old-fashioned way. I need to carry it without any magic. But it was a little too big and inconvenient to do that, especially with how corroded the gate room was. But after some brainstorming, I had an idea. Would the main circuit cable be strong enough to hold the reactor? Running through the floor and ceiling of the gate room were two massive cables with large transformers on each. It was the main circuit from the reactor, used to power everything inside the crawler and the shelter, but it was also the one thing that was untouched by corrosion. It's layered with a mix of woven and layered carbon, and its connectors are pretty heavily reinforced around the reactor, so it should be strong enough. I think, with a bit of hesitation, I reached up and stepped on the gate pushing the cables together. Kriyak the corroded room creaked as the ceiling and floor were pushed together, but it worked surprisingly well. No cables broke. Phew. Finally pulling my weight off it, I drove my tail through the ceiling and floor before wrapping it around the inside of the circuit cables. CLA and crumble. From there, it was easy. All I did was pull it out toward the water, gather up as much hydrogen and oxygen as I could, and fly out of the cave with thruster magic. P-S-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-
The air was thin enough for me to release my vacuum magic to save mana and not worry about the drag being too much for the corroded shell of the crawler. But by the time I got to Hera, I was literally on fumes. Rumble thump as I finally set the crawler down on its rear and landed. I lowered my head and took a huge gulp of the dense ambient mana. Huh. I feel sick. Realistically, I had about 3 or 4 percent of my reserve left, which in the grand scheme of things was still quite a lot. But my body didn't care if it was an ocean or a puddle from the perspective of other dragons. What did you bring this time? Hera floated out of the edge of the containment center with a curious tone in her voice. But I didn't even bother creating air between us to speak. Something that would make people think this mountain is a volcano. Read up to five chapters ahead of schedule on my Patreon. In case embedded link doesn't work, https colon slash slash www.patreon.com slash tdod. Chapter 268 The Enticement of a Nap Late Evening Midsummer The Ancient Wreckage Southwestern Holy Kingdom FFFFFWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWWW
immense change in terrain was too fast even for the monster to keep up, leaving him floating helplessly in the air in front of me. The next thing I knew, a slightly crazed, instinctual smile had come to my face. What a lucky find. Before escape could even cross the creature's mind, I ripped my right claw out of the molten ground and slashed it through the creature's neck. Craric it instantly killed the massive creature, removing a massive section of its neck like it never existed before the body finally started limply falling to the ground. Splash thud as the carcass splashed in the pool of molten rock. I leaned down and quickly zeroed in on the mana core in its chest. There it is. C-R-R-U-U-N-C-H the creature's ribs shattered as I forced my claws through them before quickly finding the core and pulling it out. Crackle the core was glowing a bright sky blue and was about the same size as the one I ate in Kilalan, but compared to that one, this had substantially more mana. However, this time, I could actually handle it. Plop bulb tossing the core into my mouth, I swallowed it like a pill before shattering it the moment it reached my stomach. C-R-A-C-K-L-E-V-W-O-O-M instantly. An immense mana wave erupted from my body before suddenly reversing directions and slamming into my reserve. But even though I braced myself for a bit of strain and pain, the sensation was like I had just poured a cup of tea into a five-gallon bucket. It was tasty, but nowhere near the amount of mana I anticipated. Or maybe it would be better to say that I was just out of touch with how large my reserve had gotten. W. What the hell? At most, my reserve filled by about 2%. That amount of mana would have ruptured my reserve, even just a couple years ago. What the hell? The next thing I knew, I was questioning everything I knew about the efficiency of my spells. Hi. Need to rework some of my magic if they consume that much. But that was for later. For now. I slowly glanced back at the turtle that was still frozen stiff. Even if his core is the same size as this guy's, it's not enough to let me be liberal with thruster spells. Essentially, no matter what I did, I would have to fly without magic for a stretch of the trip. Ha, huh, whatever. I might as well just save my energy then. Quickly spreading my wings, I turned away from the turtle and hurled myself into the air. F-W-O-S-H if only I didn't have to carry that damn elder. I could just leave the atmosphere and only use magic to maintain altitude. Quickly making my way back to the mountain, I met back up with Elios and quickly resituated my sword and other belongings behind my wing. Without much aura to spare, they got jumbled up during my hard mentalist landing, but I think that's everything. Giving one last look around the area, I tried to think of anything I still needed to do here, but nothing came to mind. I took everything I need, so Miles or the Holy Kingdom can do what they want to do with the rest. A part of me hoped that they would be able to learn a thing or two from what was left, but as I took to the sky, I had my doubts. Maybe I'll give Miles a hint when I get back. The flight after that was pretty smooth. I ended up flying southwest out of the mountains and generally followed the northwestern edge of the western continent in case I needed to land and take a break at some point. But thankfully, I managed my mana pretty well and never pushed myself far enough to feel the effects of mana exhaustion again. That did entail flying about halfway without any magic, but that was better than feeling sick. It did turn a 30-minute flight into a nearly 3-hour one though. Even cruising just shy of Mach 2 felt like a snail's pace compared to normal. But we're finally here. Cresting the horizon as I idly thought to myself was the tops of tropical green trees. A truly glorious sight for me, as it meant that I was one step closer to getting home and being able to sleep for a week or two. Crackle Fush momentarily using magic again, I hastily sped back up and eventually made it to the temple, which had even more cleared area around it than it used to, as well as quite a few more people guarding the perimeter. It was nice to see. Clearly the settlement was growing, quite quickly might I add, and Captain Lost Sar was keeping the deal. It does make me wonder what Adrian and Amelia are up to these days though. 1. But now wasn't the time for such thoughts. Right. How am I actually going to get to the rune? Father never showed me. Momentarily sparing a bit of mana to cloak myself until I dropped into the damaged tower of the temple. I quickly landed and immediately found myself in the exact same situation as when I first came here. This might be troublesome. Should I just dart through it again? I didn't want to use the mana, 
but after looking through the floor where I knew a trap was and didn't find anything, I just gave up. Ha. Huh. Well I'm glad I left the antimatter reactor connector with Hera now. I guess here goes nothing. Crunch trying to rely mostly on physical strength, I lunged forward with a horrific amount of force, further shattering the ground and launching myself down the hallway. Only using one foot to push off the ground and stay in the air or change directions on the corners. Wolf whoosh crack crack crunch crack. Thankfully, it was only a moment later that the final room came into view. Crunch abruptly coming to a stop. Countless cracks ripped across the room. But they all stopped once they met the platform the room was on. Phew. Well, the rest of this should be easy, right? Quickly catching my breath and calming down. I walked over to the space rune and noticed several names around the edge of the pedestal and a few small glowing dots next to each, within the black artifact. The names next to each node were, now kneel a small kingdom just south of the kingdom of Deasia, Saratha, Ampelos a city on the southeastern corner of Bahamut, Cremo a city in the western mountains of Bahamut, Emporio, and lastly the northernmost city in Bahamut, nicknamed the Frontier of War, Acre the home of Bahamut's main military force. After everything that's happened, I think it's a safe bet to say Miles will be there or still at the Elder Hall. And worst case, if he wasn't at either of those places, I was confident Acri would have people who didn't know where he was. Well, let's not waste any time then. Time to drop this dumbass off with Miles and go home. Whoop. But unfortunately, when I entered that space rune, I failed to think through what exactly the situation really was. Additional notes. 1. Adrian is the captain of the ship that brought Vasilius halfway between the main and western continents, and Amelia was his daughter. Chapter 145 was when Amelia was introduced, and 174 for Adrian if my memory serves. Read up to 5 chapters ahead of schedule on my Patreon. In case embedded link doesn't work, https colon slash slash www.patreon.com slash tdod. Chapter 269 The Mysterious Nature of the Void Early Morning Midsummer Temple Space Rune Eastern Oasis Well, let's not waste any time then. Time to drop this dumbass off with Miles and go home. Whoop quickly injecting a decent bit of mana into the glowing dot next to Acri. A gate expanded out of the pedestal that immediately stopped once it encompassed the artifact and letting a second gate envelope us and our surroundings. And as if that wasn't already enough to send me through a loop, the second gate didn't cut into the ground at all. Wait, what? It made sense but, at the same time, didn't. How does that work? And how did the artifact create a gate inside a gate? Is that even possible? A troubled look washed over my face immediately. In an instant I had gone from smiling, looking forward to getting home, to using every last drop of my mental energy to blast through theories. But after a moment of several different trains of thought continually getting tripped over one another, I slowed down with a deep breath and focused on the one I thought I could explain first. Okay. First, the second gate not cutting into the ground. Although I, unfortunately, wasn't focusing on it when it surrounded us, after a bit of thought and reasoning, it did line up with a few of my more experimental theories. From what I could tell, when the gate formed, Instead of going through slash around atoms to create a complete sphere, the gate formed a shape akin to a deflated ball on the ground or a water droplet on a flat surface to avoid any of the platform being sent into the void whenever someone used the rune. Normally, something like this is impossible without external assistance, similar to creating a pentagonal gate or a gate in some other complex shape. But something I had lightly theorized about over recent years called space mana strengthening was a possible explanation I had. In short, space mana strengthening was the process of strengthening a material or object with space mana compared to unattributed mana. But much like strengthening things with other attributes of mana, strengthening with space mana did, in fact, work, but it was sadly not as cut and dry as the other elements. To keep it simple, Strengthening something with space mana caused the item to interfere with the fabric of space, and that interaction would always lead to the space mana and the strengthened item completely disintegrating, which in almost all cases destroyed the item at the atomic level. After discovering that reaction, I totally stopped messing with it. In my eyes back then, such a brutal aftereffect made it completely useless, 
and I was better allocating my time to other theories. But now things made more sense. If the platform was strengthened with space mana, wouldn't it be able to stop the expansion of a gate? It'd be tedious to strengthen it meticulously enough for that. But as long as the strengthening is more crystalline than the expanding gate, it'd be doable. It was undoubtedly a theory I couldn't guarantee without doing a few experiments. But it was plausible enough for me to at least believe it. However, the other issue of the artifact forming a gate inside of another gate. That was something I was almost entirely in the dark about. If the platform doesn't get spared from the void because of space mana strengthening, how does the pedestal survive? It was a question I asked myself repeatedly because the pedestal surviving the gate couldn't be explained with anything else I could think of. No matter how I wanted to twist it, it itself was the epicenter of the gate. Had the epicenter been just outside of the pedestal, I could have used the same theory as the platform, but at the same time, creating a gate outside the center of the runes with just an artifact would be unfathomably tricky, to the point I questioned if it was even possible. Ha! Huh. No, I must be overthinking things. Deciding to take a few more steps back, I halted the theories I was formulating and tried to force more straightforward approaches. Bahamut and the ancient Fenrir definitely knew more about space mana than I do. So there must be something I'm missing. But of course, those simple theories just spiraled out of control, like a derailed train that had to be repeatedly reset. Over. And over again. Things continued like that for what felt like days, but eventually, as we were finally getting close to the gate to Acre, I was once again reminded of one of the simplest mathematical theories in the book. The negative of a negative is a positive. It was a theory I had thought about quite a bit since the discovery of space mana since it looked like a hand meant for a glove, but progress with it was extremely lacking. The predicament was essentially this. If I created a gate then went to make a bigger one around it, I wouldn't be able to give the bigger gate an epicenter without taking away from the shell of the smaller gate, which would destroy it. And if I forced the gate to exist without an epicenter, it would dissipate the instant I released it. The only way for that work would be if two gates could share the exact same epicenter. But that was a possibility I had ruled out many years prior. Could I have really been wrong about that? My thoughts jumbled as I thought of the burden of scrapping and relearning most of my space magic. But then, seemingly out of the blue, an idle thought crossed my mind that made something click. Wait. What if it isn't two gates at all? Although it sounded like a stretch at first, the more I thought about it, the more reasonable it sounded. Would it not be possible to position the six mana particles from the epicenter of the gate in a fashion that could allow for a double-layered gate? 1. The second gate wouldn't have any space in it initially, but from there, you could expand the outer layer independently and simply stack a column of space mana off the epicenter particles to make it technically remain a part of the main gate. Creating a gate in such a fashion would make it so that when the outer layer closes, everything between the inner and outer layer would be sent into the void while keeping the inner gate intact so it could just dissipate afterward, leaving everything inside essentially untouched. It simply clicked too well for me to have many doubts. And of course, it was that moment when I was most dumbfounded that we were finally released from the void. Whoop. Holy shit. If I can do that with gates, I can. Huh. My thoughts were promptly cut off by the bright morning sun that shined through the shell of the gate. Oh, right, I was going to Acre. I got so sidetracked that I nearly forgot what I was doing. Quickly adjusting my eyes to the bright light as the gate dissipated, I found myself standing on a solid half-kilometer-wide mithril platform completely surrounded by a 20-meter metal wall with three mid-size ancients laying on it. It honestly looked like something akin to an execution circle. Am I in the right place? But my doubts were quickly destroyed upon seeing Acre's insignia on the bands around the horns and ankles of the ancients. Two, ah, uh, they must be for security. Maybe they can point me toward Miles. As I walked over to one of the ancients, he picked his head up and gave me an unusual look before glancing at the other two. I didn't really pay it mind at the time. Sir, D-U-V-W-W-W-W-W-O-M My voice was abruptly cut short by the three ancients promptly surrounding the entire area with silencing magic. I recommend you start explaining yourself. The ancient in front of me spoke with an extremely aggressive tone as the dome of silencing magic finished. Oh, what's up with these guys? Do you mean this guy? 
I motioned back to the elder as Elios picked him up in his mouth. He's a traitorous dragon involved with the holy. But I couldn't even finish speaking before one of the ancients behind me closed the distance between us and swung at Elios. It was the gesture that told me everything I needed to know. Additional notes. 1. To visualize it, think of every particle of space mana being a go piece. A squish sphere basically. With each end of each piece being connected to the end of another piece. To form a circle slash sphere. That is a gate. Now imagine shifting up the pieces on each axis up slightly so instead of the exact end of the pieces touching the rest. It is the underbelly of the piece. Then created another circle slash sphere touching the top side of the piece. That is the idea. 2. Being a military city. Acre's insignia was simply a rune that was the combination of a strengthening and elasticity rune. During the Great War the rune was on everything, and over time, as it became outdated, people accepted it as Acre's insignia. It had become a symbol of strength. Read up to 5 chapters ahead of schedule on my Patreon. In case embedded link doesn't work, https colon slash slash www.patreon.com slash tdod. Chapter 270, Mass Destruction. Early morning midwinter, Acre Bahamut. Oh, what's up with these guys? I gave the ancient in front a glare. Do you mean explaining this guy? I motioned back to the elder as Elios picked him up in his mouth. He's a traitorous dragon involved with the holy. But I couldn't even finish before one of the ancients behind me closed the distance between us and swung at Elios. It flipped my switch instantly. Fushklack narrowly dodging the swing. I bolted to the side and knocked his other leg out from under him before immediately turning and driving my head into his underside. Crackwaham. F-W-O-S-H-S-L-M-C-R-A-C-K Levy W-O-M He immediately went tumbling over the thick metal wall around the platform before exiting the dome of silencing magic. Hey, that didn't feel like detaining force. Do they recognize the elder? My cold gaze slowly turned to the ancient in front of me again. What reason do you have to kill me? Are you all dragons who have betrayed Bahamut as well? My expression slowly turned angered. TCH. The moment I finished, the ancient clicked his tongue and lunged at me, with the other ancient behind quickly following suit. Fush. Thankfully, the moment they made a move, Elios darted off my back with the elder, so I finally had the chance to move more freely. They're really going for the kill. VWOM crunch before I could even read their moves. Their auras slammed into me like a tidal wave strong enough to crack the mithril under my feet. But you'll need more than that hold me in place. Fush nearly instantly flapping my wings. I lunged at the ancient in front and went to bite his neck. But the side of my face was immediately met with his wing. Without mana, I had lost my immense speed advantage. FWWHAM flicking my head to the side and blocking my vision. He swung up his paw and slammed it into my chest launching me through the air. Fush. Thankfully, the hit woke my senses up. Huh. Quickly flipping onto my back, I looked down at the other ancient below me with a predatory smile. I can spare a bit of mana for you. B-A-A-N-N-N-G-G-G-C-R-R-A-C-K-K-K The sound barrier shattered like fragile glass as I flapped my wings and used antimatter to flip over and drive my body weight into his head. Cruumble. The entire mithril platform exploded instantaneously splintering the metal wall surrounding it and throwing obliterated buildings and roads into the air behind it. It looked as if there was a meteor impact. But even still, the ancient survived. FWOSH flapping his wings, he tossed me off his head and drove his shoulders into my side. Wayam, Fush being thrown into the cloud of mithril dust, I hastily looked around for the other ancient before the morning light bouncing through the glistening dust turned dark. It was a shadow. There he is. Fwoosh I hurled myself toward the source of the shadow without hesitation. But the moment I left the dust, I was greeted by jaws nearly the size of my body. Shit! Crunch my scales finally started to crack as he bit into me before using his whole body to slam me into the ground. W-H-M-M-N-T-R-E-M-B-L-E Another immense shockwave spread through the area as a few of his teeth finally started to pierce my scales. As if, crack shattering several bones in his snout. I slammed my front claws into the side of his nose and the roof of his mouth before using all my strength to turn his head over and slam it into the ground. But even though he did all he could to try and plant his feet, 
The back of his head was already planted into the ground. At www.wwwoshhhhh his colossal body was nearly completely vertical for a moment as I threw him over me, painting an unforgettable image in the minds of all those who could see it. But he didn't let me slam him down. Fush opening his mouth slightly, he flicked his head to the side, not caring that my claws were deep in the roof of his mouth. Crackle splat as I was launched out, my claws dug out through the roof of his mouth bringing a huge amount of bone, flesh, and several teeth with me. F-W-W-W-W-O-S-H-W-H-A-M-S-L-A-M-W-H-A-M-C-R-U-N-C-H-H-H quickly bringing my tumbling body to a halt. I looked up and met eyes with the bloodied, monster-like dragon that looked like he was going to rip me limb from limb. T-C-H. That just pissed him off. Keeping watch of his body language, I lowered my body to dodge and counterattack whatever he could throw at me but a massive pair of claws slammed into my side before he even moved. Huh! William Zip Crunch dying the ring of the metal wall around the platform filled the air as I slammed into it and ripped its remaining solid section entirely out of the ground. But they didn't simply watch the scene. FWP instantly darting to the side, a massive paw came slamming down on where I was. Dying crackle it was the paw of the ancient I crushed. Shit! He can still move like that. At that moment, every ounce of hope I had to incapacitate or kill the ancients without mana was thrown out the window. Fuck. If only I had my mana. Crunchwem FWPCRACKLEFWOSH But as I dodged several spells from the bigger ancient and a flurry of attacks from the smaller one, an idea came to mind. One that would have repulsed me just a few years ago. You should have taken the easy way out and stayed down. Instantly tensing my whole body, a cloud of mana moved out of my nearly empty reserve and flooded into several of my attribute nodes. Cracklebank whoosh. Instantly teleporting into the underside of the smaller, 80 meter tall ancient flying above me. I dug my claws into his chest and used the mix of antimatter thrusters and brute strength to hurl him into the ground. FWOSHWHAMMM. With his underside pointing up toward me, my stare turned cold and the bloodlust surrounding me thickened. C-R-A-C-K-L-E-B-R-R-R-M-M-M likely because of his instincts, he released a blazing beam of fire and light magic with a look of horror on his mangled face. But my heartless gaze remained unchanged even as it enveloped my body. You should have thought of the consequences before you stood back up. Scrackle T-S-S-S the small ball of clear liquid sizzled on my back as it was spread across my body. It looked like water but was certainly nothing so stable. Flash VWOMBAANG the ground exploded as my paws punched into his chest like a pile drive, sending a shockwave several magnitudes greater than most earthquakes straight into his reserve, with only the dense divinity around it preventing me from plowing straight through. VWOMMM The amount of mana that erupted into the air was my numbing, causing light to warp and the colors of everything around to turn blue. But to my mana-starved mind, it looked like nothing more than a feast. VWWWWOM on the verge of losing consciousness from mana exhaustion, I felt the vast cloud of mana start flooding into my reserve, heightening my senses again instantly. My eyes were like that of a terminator as I looked up at the other ancient, through the cloud of glistening mithril. Crackle more antimatter began to form on my back as the surrounding mana thinned until finally... The surge of mana into my reserve finished. Bung I closed the distance between us instantly. But the moment I exited the cloud of dust, I found the tip of a claw beneath my chin. TCH. Fighting without my aura is such a pain. Crack his claw slammed into my neck like a train before slamming his paw into my chest and crushing me against the ground. WHAMMM. I immediately dug my claws into his paw and readied a mix of earth and space magic to shred it but I didn't have that opportunity. Crunch putting his entire weight and aura on me, I sank further into the ground before a flood of earth magic ripped through my claws, thankfully shattering them before the magic could reach my paw, but it left me in a pickle. Fuck. Tis crackle quickly forming a sphere of antimatter in my breath gland. I opened my mouth and let it rip. VWOMBOOM the ground encompassing me vanished instantly as molten rock was launched into the air and the blazing beam engulfed the ancient's leg, melting his scales and incinerating the center of his paw before he could react. 
Whoosh whoop splash quickly turning over in the pool of molten rock after he jumped away. I locked eyes on him again. His mouth had already stopped bleeding, but his leg was mangled. He already carved out all the burnt flesh to avoid scarring. He's still confident. Whoosh feeling a steady breeze returning, I glanced to check if the silencing magic had dissipated, but instead caught the gazes of dozens of dragons, at least at the elder stage on the ground and in the air, staring at me. You have to be kidding. The glow between my scales quickly shifted to a bright blue as I formed a substantial amount of antimatter in my breath gland. I need to try and talk my way out. But I didn't have that opportunity. To think a traitor would bring themselves to Acre. The ancient I hid out of the area earlier was flying amongst the other dragons. Does everyone see the jade artifact by the sword under his wing? That is a medallion of the Holy Kingdom, an artifact only used to transfer messages between the higher-ups of the church. So they really are traitors. My faint uncertainty eased instantly. But a message artifact? It hardly even looks like an artifact, so how does that work? I quickly decided to make it my alibi. Since it sounds like you are familiar with it, why don't you come over and show me how to use it? I'd gladly share the message with everyone if I knew how. The ancient wasn't very happy with my response. Ha! Huh, a traitor would share a message such as that? How dare you lure me in with such a blatant lie? It was a bold comeback, but I didn't have a counter. If I toss the artifact to him, he'll probably just break it. But to my surprise, there was one other ancient one not much smaller than Miles, that wasn't buying it. I wonder how many years it has been since I've seen such an intriguing young man. He was almost exactly 100 meters tall, downing an insane number of artifacts, with his most recognizable feature being the amethyst-colored scales and numerous horns coming out of his chin like a beard. Boy, are you implying that you will share that message with everyone if I tell you how? His name was Astraftero Melon one of Miles' closest friends and the commander of several of the strongest military units within Bahamut. There is no way he is with the Holy Kingdom, right? I gave it a bit of thought before responding. If you teach me how, I will gladly put the message on display, but I cannot give it to you. I apologize. The other ancient didn't let the opportunity slip either. He is going to break it and blame Sir Melon's teachings. Several other dragons were quick to agree with clearly hostile expressions. But the commander didn't budge. If he breaks it, we will temporarily treat it as an accident and bring him under investigation. There is no reason to outright kill a man who may be telling the truth. But Sir Mellon, he has already. I don't want to hear another word from you, Officer Rayon. He cut off the ancient without mercy. There has been a new investigation issued, as of midnight that involves everyone here. You will all receive a briefing on it later today. For now, I will handle this. You are all dismissed. With just a few words, the dozens of dragons scattered, leaving just the three guards and myself with the commander, as he walked over to me. His towering figure was surrounded by a sense of oppression, immediately reminding me of Miles. But his expression was far more unreadable. Shit. Is he really on my side? Read up to five chapters ahead of schedule on my Patreon. In case embedded link doesn't work, https colon slash slash www.patreon.com slash tdod. Also, check out my new novel, The Systems Harvester. https colon slash slash www.royalroad.com slash fiction slash 69961 slash DZ Stem Harvester. Chapter 271 the wrong tale. Mid-morning mid-winter, Acre, Bahamut, Crackle crunched the mithril dust crunched like sand under Commander Mellon's feet as he fearlessly walked toward me before coming to a stop only a few hundred meters away. He absolutely towered over me, even at a distance. But even though I was far from fearful of him, his presence alone kept me on edge. Shit, why is he so hard to read? His expression was cold, and his eyes were dead. He truly looked like a man who had given up on living, but his slightly curious tone and glowing aura made things seem like the complete opposite. My name is Astraf Tero Mellon, the vice commander of Bahamut's main force here in Acre, and the head of the Artifact and Elixir Research Divisions. May I request your name? So, he is in charge of research. I hesitated momentarily before glancing at the other ancients to try and figure out whose side he was on 
but neither of them did anything obvious. My name is Vasilius White, H.M. Are you related to the noble White family? Something like that. He quickly looked me up and down before looking me in the eye. I see. In that case, please take out the artifact and look inside it. How many lines intersect? Both of the other ancients immediately tensed up, but I tilted my head in confusion. Lines? I had looked in the artifact previously and did see several lines, but they looked like divisions between layers of sediment rather than purposefully placed pieces. Seven? Ho, oh, to think the humans would have such a leap in progress. His aura immediately sharpened around the artifact, but I used a bit of leftover space mana to shake it off. He noticed it right away. It seems you don't trust me. I immediately shook my head. There is only one person who I can trust with this. I apologize. Whether this is really a message artifact or not, I should verify it with Miles. May I be so rude to ask who that would be? That would be Miles' calf. My voice was abruptly cut off by a streak of light that instantly ripped through the space mana surrounding the artifact before slamming into the side of my broken claw and exploding. Crack thankfully. I managed to intercept it with my claw, or else the molten steel marble would have definitely obliterated the jade artifact. But at that moment, I couldn't have cared less about it. This is steel. And that magic. The air instantly turned heavy as I looked over at the ancient in the sky with enough bloodlust to make the commander's aura sharpen and turn into a wall of blades. However, he didn't realize what the situation had become. My eyes locked onto the ancient in the air like a dragon who found a human in its nest. Where did you get that marble? My voice echoed through the area like the voice of death, immediately making the two remaining guards' faces pale and the commander fully jump up. W what do you care? BNGFWOOSH using antimatter to instantly close the distance between us. I forced my half-broken claws into his neck and adjusted my wings to drive him into the ground. Wampum crunch a ring of scales around his neck shattered like glass as my claws suddenly started to heal, progressively digging further into his flesh. I was like a feral monster as I looked into his eyes with a bright yellow glow in my scales. Now speak. His face was that of someone who had seen a ghost. A Atlas. A professor in Atlas taught me the technique and gave me a bag of those marbles a few months ago. Clink clunk that a small pouch immediately fell off his side spilling out several dozen perfect steel marbles as it hit the ground. They were marbles I had made for Cristallo. A professor, huh? Time paused as I looked back at the other ancient. To think the Holy Kingdom would be shameless enough to target the next generation as well. Crackle the ancient scales shattered between my claws as I clenched my paw. At that moment, there was nothing that could save him, but the instant before I relocated the atoms in his throat to the mantle of the planet, I eased up. If you don't give me the information I want, I'm going to throw you into space and let you rot. B-A-A-N-G-F-W-O-S-H Commander Melon instantly appeared next to me before stopping his claws just short of the back of my head. Young man, I believe you have gone too far. My anxiousness about him being an enemy eased instantly. Even if I were to blow a hole through his neck it wouldn't be too far. Traitorous scum like these two deserve to die. Whoop tossing the jade artifact up in front of his face. I looked back and locked onto the other ancient. He was in the air, darting toward the horizon. As if. But before I could even prepare the magic to catch up to him, a streak of light ripped across the sky and obliterated the base of his right wing. Crackle bomb. The ancient immediately lost balance. But while he was not slow to recover, by the time he looked for the source of the attack, Elios was in his face. Crack FWOSHWHAM a massive plume of dust, dirt, and rubble was thrown into the air as the colossal dragon hit the ground before Elios darted down and slammed into the ancient one more time. Bam. The commander watched the scene with a blank expression, but he didn't stay like that forever. To call my men traitor scum and mercilessly attack them right in front of me. He slowly looked back at me with a stare of intent. Do you take me for someone weak? His aura surrounded me once more before I gave him a distasteful look. Someone who can say they are friends with Miles still considers trash who turn their back on Bahamut as your men. Turn their back on Bahamut? That is quite the claim. His blank expression slowly morphed to show a hint of anger. Yeah, because countless pieces of another jade artifact being in this bastard's pouch isn't enough. 
I spoke with heavy sarcasm as I tossed the pouch of steel marbles to the commander. Since that's the case, why don't you go ask it from the source? His expressionless face immediately started to darken as he turned to look at the ancient under my feet. But I just moved my wing in front of his face. Oh, I meant the other guard. This fucker is mine. Seeing my bloodlust return as I looked back down at the ancient, Commander Mellon finally turned away and got ready to fly over to the guard Elio's incapacitated. But before you go, take that bastard too. I pointed to his feet as Elio's darted up next to him and dropped the body of the elder. I ran into him at a shelter in the mountains north of the ancient wreckage. He was the one I took that jade from. The commander's face only became more furious as he saw and eventually picked up the elder with his aura. I see. As he spread his wings, he glanced back at me with a threatening look. If you are wrong, I hope you are prepared for the consequences. FWOSH finally taking to the air, the commander made his way over to the other ancient with great haste, leaving just Elios and me with the other ancient. It made me look like a hawk who had just caught a mouse. Now, how about you start explaining exactly how you got that pouch of marbles? The interrogation went smoothly after that. According to the ancient, the person who gave them both the marbles and the jade was a professor in Atlas who said they managed to create the new set of spells after having an epiphany from watching a student's magic a few months prior. Thankfully, no matter how I probed him, fear of hearing that something had happened to Cristallo never came to light. But at the same time, the possibility still existed. There is no way she would just give those to someone, even if a professor asked for them. But there was nothing else I could dig out of the ancient himself. I guess I'll just have to pay the academy a visit when I get home. Shake pulling my claws out of the ancient's neck. I finally wrapped up my questions and dragged the guard across the dust and rubble-covered ground before tossing him over next to the commander. Fwish crunch. The whole time I was interrogating the guard. He had been torturing the other ancient in an increasingly brutal manner, with a no longer expressionless look on his face. However, contrary to before, his voice had turned cold. It seems you have finished with him. I quickly nodded. I figured out what I needed to, and since you seem to be on our side, I will just leave him with you. He has a loose jaw, so you should be able to get plenty out of him. How convenient. Crackle the other guard's ribs cracked as the commander pulled his paw off his barely conscious body. Earlier, you mentioned the one person you trusted to leave the artifact to was Miles Kalfas, correct? I thought you just said that name to pull me off your trail, but I think I understand now. H.M.? Although I was preparing to leave, I paused when he spoke. You are related to the Ragnarok, aren't you? His tone had once again become curious. But after seeing me nod... He just turned back to the guards. I see. In that case, I will not poke my nose in any further. However, before you leave, read through this. He immediately moved a letter out of a small bag under his wing and held it in front of me. Visually, the paper was completely blank and looked just like the ones I found on the Elder in the mountains. But looking with my aura revealed a complex set of runes, seemingly carved into the paper's surface. If you inject mana into the rune on the bottom corner of it, then evenly push mana behind it, the text will appear. What? Immediately questioning how the text would appear since the runes didn't have any obviously useful effects, I followed his instructions and injected a bit of mana into it. Voom the paper immediately started vibrating, and as instructed, I put an even layer of mana behind it, but seemingly nothing happened. At least, that was the case until I looked at the letter with my aura again and noticed countless patterned channels of mana flowing up through the letter. It formed a text. A string of draconic letters mentioning what happened at the Elder Hall and detailing a fight I hadn't heard about involving Amphitrite Aurenas before eventually saying something directly regarding Miles. A part of me couldn't believe what I was seeing. He entered his dragon sleep? Read up to five chapters ahead of schedule on my Patreon. In case embedded link doesn't work, https colon slash slash www.patreon.com slash tdod. Chapter 272, Atlas, the City of the Powerful. Mid-afternoon, mid-winter, Emporio, Bahamut. Fwish the warm afternoon air quickly blew across my scales as I glided through the sky on the northern outskirts of Emporio. At that point, it had been several hours since I left Acre, but nothing too eventful happened. 
For starters, after reading the letter addressed to Commander Mellon about Miles entering his dragon's sleep and being fatally wounded in a fight I didn't know about, I quickly told him to send a group of researchers to the shelter by the wreckage and left for the Elder Hall. Who could have done that much damage to Miles? Especially with Amphitrite there. I had a bad feeling about it. But unfortunately, even after getting there, I couldn't get that close to Miles without causing some issues. However, from the air, it was apparent how terrible his condition was. He definitely would have died if he didn't enter his dragon's sleep. But while I really wanted to know what happened, Amphitrite, the only one who actually saw the event, had left several hours before I arrived and didn't tell anyone anything. Then, with Leander also still unconscious, the only person I could ask about what happened was the female ancient that worked under Leander, who was in charge of the situation. But she wasn't sure what happened either. All she said was that Amphitrite flew straight for Emporio almost immediately after Miles's dragon sleep started. She must have been going for the space rune. It was pretty unfortunate. The space rune opened up every other fathomable possibility for where she could have gone. So even though I felt like I needed to hear what happened, I had no choice but to give it up for now. Currently, I need to focus on Atlas. Knowing a professor that was on the Holy Kingdom's side was close enough to Cristallo to take the steel beads I gave her left a terrible taste in my mouth. But regardless of that, instead of returning to Acre, since it was a little closer to the Elder Hall than Emporio, I decided to follow Amphitrite's flight path just in case I could catch her. But as expected, I had no luck. It's a shame. But I planned to bounce through Emporio anyway. Having been away from home for so long, I wanted to get Cristallo something, but I needed to figure out what. I'm sure she would prefer something made by me, but I'm not sure what to make. My plan was to spend a few minutes looking through the streets of Emporio for some ideas on what to make while I moved to Atlas through the space room. I should have enough mana to make something nice as long as I don't get into some big fight. But, what to make? My ideas were mostly weapons but I wasn't so sure how mother and father would react to me bringing her something like that. Hmm. What else? She likes science. What if I got her something like? Then it hit me. The perfect gift. It was something simple to make for someone like me, but something I was confident she would love. It honestly made me excited to see how she would react. I know what I can make for her birthday now too. That was something just around the corner as well. Although I didn't do it intentionally. I was going to return home just two weeks before our birthdays, giving me some time to spend time with everyone, regain some mana, and even begin my investigation in the academy. All that was left was to go to Atlas. Home, sweet home, here I come. Quickly returning to the space rune, I waited for a few other groups to take the rune before eventually going on myself. Vroom. This time I carefully watched how the rune and artifact worked and it turned out to be exactly as I hypothesized. Both the platform being space mana strengthened, and the double gates layered functionality lined up perfectly with my theories. For the main space rune to have simple space mana runes to strengthen the platform as well. It's quite smart. Although it would have issues if activated too quickly after initially being built, if the rune was given a few months to strengthen the platform, it would work quite reliably. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense how the artifact manages to make the double-layered gate so flawlessly, but learning that it for another time. For now, I needed to put my focus into something else. I wonder how she will react when she uses it for the first time. My time in the void quickly passed after that. I promptly got to work on Cristallo's gift, and used my spare time to think about exactly how I would go about investigating the academy even though I would need to see what it was like before planning anything. But before I knew it, I made it to the Atlas Space Runes, a famed array of two dozen space runes built on a single colossal platform made of mithril that was so high grade that even the biggest of ancients couldn't do anything beyond cosmetic damage with just physical force. But while the glowing platform was eye-catching, as the gate dissipated, I was presented with a much more astonishing view. W. Whoa. Surrounding the massive platform were countless absolutely colossal structures, some pushing over half a kilometer tall, with an incredible number of dragons with varying, brightly colored scales in the sky and on the ground. It made Emporio look like some backwater town. 
Sir, please come this way for the identity screening. A young ancient in glistening armor called me over immediately. As I made my way over, I noticed his look of distaste but assumed it was nothing. Sir, do you have an Atlas Nobility Medallion? I immediately tilted my head. A Nobility Medallion? Not that I know of. Ha! Huh. His look of annoyance immediately worsened. To have one made is one gold. For a single time entry, it is fifty silver. If you are a high noble, the medallion is free of charge. And if you do not have the funds to enter, please go to the back of the line for the space runes. The whites are high nobility, right? I quickly pulled out my mithril ID and handed it to him. HM? But instead of what I expected, he gave it a skeptical look before looking me up and down. Sir, I am going to need you to follow me. Huh? What's this about? At first, I thought it was just a discrepancy in my ID not matching my appearance after it changed so much, or the fact my scales were black, but my name was white. But eventually, I was led into a massive building that looked like an empty shop but was immediately led to a lower level. As we walked down, things started making more sense. These rats are everywhere. Although I hadn't confirmed it, I came to the assumption that he just liked the ancient Sinacri a dragon with the holy kingdom here to catch targets of interest, and he was leading me underground to deal with me. However, as we continued downward, there was a rhythmic vibration that steadily increased in strength as we descended until, eventually, the entire spiraling hallway shook. Thump 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 what is that? Finally making it to the end of the path, we came up to a massive door with a scorching heat emitting from it, along with the noise of metal being hammered. Where am I being brought? Finally stopping in front of it, the young ancient eventually knocked on the door with a bit of hesitancy. Sir Atsalai, the man you told me to keep my eye out for is here. The rhythmic vibrations finally stopped for a moment before an incredibly oppressive aura shot through the door and surrounded me. Ah, shit. Now wasn't the time. Immediately bracing myself for a fight, I bent down and readied a bit of mana. How am I going to do this without destroying a sector of the city above? But then the door finally swung open, revealing a colossal, 105 meter tall ancient with dark maroon scales partially covered in soot, with a wide smile on his face. The young master has finally arrived. You're even scarier than I was told. His voice was that of a jolly old man, but his aura was as lively as a child's. W. Who are you? He quickly motioned the knight back up the stairs before using a bit of water magic to clean off his scales. Tsss says my name is Vathis Atsalai, the best smith in Bahamut, but also someone very close with your grandmother and indebted to your great-grandmother. He quickly motioned me in to have a seat at a massive wooden table that looked to be carved from a single tree, but I was still hesitant. A couple years ago, your grandmother paid me a visit and said that you would eventually come here, and since you are a Ragnarok, I would have to be the one to make your medallion so I had the knights keep an eye out for you and your furry friend. He glanced over at Elios, who was sticking his head in the furnace, smelling around while he closed the door. I couldn't deny that I was still a little on edge, but it had more so turned to confusion at that point. So the reason I was brought through that sketchy store and spiraling hallway was just so I could have my medallion made? I was expecting to have to fight some people. Haha, <laughs> you look disappointed. He finally made his way over to the table as well, before setting a barrel in front of me. Thump can this make up for it? It had an instantly recognizable aroma. Pietita? Haha, <laughs> glad to see you are familiar with it. If you had never had it, I would have needed to have a discussion with your grandmother. I finally started easing up as I put the barrel in my mouth. His smile widened after seeing my face of satisfaction. Well, now that I have eased the tension a bit. Let's get to the matters at hand. There are a few things I would like to discuss. Read up to five chapters ahead of schedule on my Patreon. In case embedded link doesn't work, https colon slash slash www.patreon.com slash tdod. Also if you are looking for a new story, check out my new novel, The Systems Harvester. Chapter 273, The Tension of Reunion. Late afternoon, midwinter, Atlas, Bahamut. Well, now that I have eased the tension a bit, let's get to the matters at hand. There are a few things I would like to discuss. Having finally eased my nerves, I gave Sir Atsalai a curious look. Sure thing. What do you need? 
I need to get going, but I guess I need to wait on the medallion regardless. For starters, could I see your ID? I'd like to work on the medallion while we talk. Hopefully, it shouldn't take long. Oh, perfect. Without thinking much of it, I tossed it to him. He snatched it out of the air with his aura immediately before looking it over and spinning it around. This is some extremely high-grade mythal you got. I will pay you more than you'd believe if you could tell me where to find some of it. To say that even while knowing I'm a Ragnarok. Although it was true I could almost always create my own coins or even head to the eastern oasis or the kingdom of Zan's old capital for a bit of money. Such sources weren't viable for more considerable sums. Plus, this shouldn't take much work from me. I'll be sure to keep an eye out, but I expect to only be able to sell the mithril to you rather than point you to a location. He immediately smiled. I will gladly take anything you wish to sell to me, but keep in mind the cost solely depends on the grade. Of course. Sweet. I can make some really high-grade stuff in my free time. Clack finally setting the ID back on the table, he turned and walked toward the colossal furnace simultaneously using his aura to move several things around. Clink line spop. But even while doing dozens of things with his aura at the same time, he spoke exceptionally casually. Out of curiosity, who made that sword under your wing? He paused as he glanced back at it. It's one of only a few weapons that I can't discern the technique used to create it. Ah, uh, this old thing? I quickly pulled it out and laid it on the table. Creek I made this a while back. Over time, I just made small changes to it, but after my recent growth, I plan to remake it entirely. He immediately burst out laughing. Haha, you made that yourself? I truly deserve to be shamed for doubting your grandmother's praises. Quickly picking it up with his aura, he moved it next to his head and inspected it closely. Its balance is a bit off, and the material of the blade is a bit soft, but I can't find even the slightest imperfections within the metal itself. Do you mind if I ask how you made it? I immediately shrugged. I just used mana. I took material from the air and ground, turned it into what I wanted, and pieced it together, starting with a frame and building it out in layers. He gave me a look filled with both skepticism and curiosity. But how does that work? This is clearly some extremely high-grade material. It shouldn't be possible to make anything remotely this strong using that method. I tilted my head slightly. What do you mean? Even if I were to try and create a simple bar of this metal, it would crumble the moment I released it. The only way to make such a material hold is to contaminate it with other materials, but then it loses its purity and strength. Ah, uh, is he referring to balancing molecules? I took a moment to think of how to explain it before just going for it. If he has gotten far enough to piece atoms together, he should be able to understand. Well, you see... When it comes to those tiny particles, they each have. It only took us a moment to get lost in conversation. I gave him a quick rundown on atoms and molecules and showed him how to make higher grade materials using carbon as a framework. He was an exceptionally quick learner, even if his talent was far from rivaling Hera's. Eventually, he got so interested that, when he started getting close to finishing the medallion, he began throwing offers at me to teach him more, such as becoming his disciple. Him becoming my disciple, a bag of a few hundred platinum, then progressively larger sums all the way to a dozen royal gold coins. But while the sum was unfathomable, I didn't end up caving into the pressure. Are you sure? He reluctantly started cleaning up the freshly crafted medallion as he looked me in the eyes. I can do anything you want. I can even be your servant if you wish. Ha ha, I guess I should expect such curiosity from an ancient. His request made me feel a bit awkward, but it was also true that nothing bad would come from forming a connection with such an influential dragon. How about this? You can send me a letter with up to four questions once per month. I will answer or explain whatever you wish me to, but it can only be using those questions. He quickly pulled his head back and gave me a quizzical look before eventually smiling. You truly aren't a child, no matter how I look at it. He seemed to like that though. All right, I can do that. I hope you don't expect easy questions. Haha, <laughs> of course not. If the world of magic has really gone as stagnant and even backtracked as much as Hera says it has, I should make it start moving again. It was not a simple decision. Getting the cogs of societal growth to turn again was something I had thought about over the course of several years. But as I was always happy with how things were, 
I never did anything. Telling dragons how to make anything they wish would also be like opening Pandora's box. But even though I still believe that to be the case, according to Hera, such an ability would be limited to older ancients and was a skill known and used throughout the golden era, even if their reasons for why it worked weren't accurate. If that's the case, maybe it won't be too bad. But just in case, I should probably introduce science to Saratha as well. Well, I think this is all. Are you sure you want to leave your sword with me? You could easily sell it for at least a royal gold even if you sold it as raw material. Yeah, it's fine. I would rather give you an example to learn from. His smile widened as he handed the medallion to me. You would make a fine teacher. You should teach at the academic. Nope. I gave him an immediate, blunt response. I have no interest in teaching the masses anything. He quickly let out a sigh. Ha, I thought I'd try. Well, in any case, I wish I could hold you here longer. But you look like you're ready to go. I was quick to nod. I think it's about time I get going. There was a short moment of silence before he turned to me and lowered his head all the way to the ground. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to learn from you, even if it is not much. No worries. I'm just killing two birds with one stone. Before I go though, be sure to keep your eyes on the guards. He raised his brow as he looked up at me. I just came from Akri, and the three ancients that guarded the space rune were traitors working with the Holy Kingdom. They were a real pain. If you want more details, you will have to ask Commander Melon though. I don't know how much he wants to disclose. His expression instantly turned sour. So the ignorant have finally started to move. Somehow, he seemed well aware of the situation already. Ha, ah, well, thanks for telling me. Although I will have to talk to the guys in Acre about it, I will be sure to keep my eye out. Regardless, thank you for coming. Of course, it was my pleasure. I will look forward to your letter. Ha ha, of course. We both quickly gave our goodbyes after that, finally parting ways after much discussion. He's a good ally to have. As I walked back up the long ramp back to the surface, I had a lot on my mind. But once I saw the light through the windows of the dusty shop, my mind cleared. Right. It's time to finally go home. I was excited, excited beyond belief. But at the same time, I was nervous. Quickly exiting the store and taking to the sky, I reoriented myself with the horizon and started flying to where mother had told me the estate was several years prior. However, it, unfortunately, still wasn't easy to find, and it took some asking around, but I managed to find it just before sunset. Whoa. The estate itself was considerably smaller than our previous estates, with much smaller fields and gardens around the main building. But when comparing it to the surrounding area, being mostly comprised of dense buildings and streets, it truly stood out on a mind-blowing scale. Even compared to the other noble estates, it really stands out. The building was clearly much older than almost anything nearby, but the old aesthetic looked incredibly good and made it pop even when surrounded by countless other lavish buildings and enormous estates. Sometimes I forget the position of the White family, but that was enough gawking. Quickly making my way down to the main entrance, I came face to face with two nearly 70 meter tall ancients with bright white armor and artifacts with the white family insignia on them. Sir, onlookers aren't allowed in. I ripped out my medallion and threw it in front of his face instantly. My chest was tight, and adrenaline was pumping through my veins as I looked at the estate through the tall metal gate. Although it had only been a few years, so much had happened that I couldn't help but be nervous. It only got worse when the knight looked at the medallion. Ah, uh, Sir White, we were eagerly waiting for your arrival. Although he sounded like he didn't really believe it, he motioned to the other guard and had him open the gate. Whoop faint mumbling ding, the gate opened as several artifacts lit up around it. The other guard was quick to speak as well. The estate will be sending out a maid if you wish to wait for an escort, but regardless, we dearly hope you enjoy your SD. Fwush immediately darting through the gate and up to the door. The attention of everyone nearby locked on me. But I truly could not have cared less. Huh. My anxiety only grew as I looked up at the handle of the colossal door. Well. It's now or never. Quickly moving my wing up to open the door, I had a short moment of hesitation. But the world didn't care about a time for pause. Click the lock undid itself before I even touched it. Additional notes. In preparation for the next chapter, 
I will give a short refresher for those who need it. Zachary Ragnarok Vasilius's mother, Asto Ragnarok White Vasilius's father, Cristallo Ragnarok Vasilius's sister, Maria Cristallo's maid, from the kingdom of Kilalan Ark, Chloe Vasilius's maid, read up to five chapters ahead of schedule on my Patreon. In case embedded link doesn't work, https colon slash slash www.patreon.com slash tdod. Chapter 274. Troublesome Curiosity. Mid-afternoon, mid-winter. Atlas, Bahamut. Cristallo Ragnarok, a few hours prior. Cristallo, how about you? Do you know what this rune is for? The professor gave me a curious look as he motioned toward a glowing rune on the wall. It was a rune far more complex than he was showing previously, but I hardly noticed that change. It is a rune that would shoot a thin beam of water. Professor. His smile quickly turned proud. Ho ho, that is correct, but you are missing another component. Momentarily turning back to the class, he moved to the side and made the rune significantly bigger. If anyone can tell me what else it does, I will bring you the treat of your choice tomorrow. The eyes of everyone in class immediately lit up as they all focused on the rune. Several people quickly jumped up and raised their hands, hoping for the professor to choose them. Young Polinos, what do you think? The young boy in front of me immediately answered. Does it heat the water? Ho ho, that is a good guess, but not quite. How about you, Miss Tara? She immediately jumped up out of her seat. Is it lightning magic? Her humanoid form's avian wings twitched with excitement. Yes, that is correct. Now, can you guess what that lightning magic is for? She immediately hesitated before finally blurting it out. Is it using the water as a medium to extend its range? The professor's smile immediately widened. This class truly exceeds my expectations. Be sure to tell me what you would like after class. Several students looked disappointed after hearing that she was right, but most were still eagerly listening, knowing another opportunity would likely arise. Finally turning back to everyone else, the professor shrunk the rune and picked up two fruit off his desk. That is correct. Did everyone hear that? This rune is meant to give pure lightning spells better range and increased potency. Allow me to demonstrate. Thump tap carefully setting two fruit on the far end of his desk. He took a few steps away and stuck his hand out. Now if I use a simple bolt spell with 50 units of mana, assuming I use half of it for control and half of it for strength, what will happen to the fruit? Several students immediately jumped up before the professor pointed to a boy in the middle. With only 25 units for strength, if it doesn't deviate, it would only blacken the skin and maybe knock it off the desk. I quickly nodded in agreement. At that range, it would barely be able to kill a rodent. We all watched silently as a yellow glow appeared in the professor's hand, and thin arcs of lightning became visible. Crackle zap crack crack. With a bright flash of light and a loud crack, the fruit on the desk turned black and was sent rolling over the edge. Thump it was exactly as we expected. Now, what will happen if I use the rune I just showed you all on the other fruit, this time omitting the control mana? Remember, the rune's mana ratios are 7 part lighting, 2 part wind, and 1 part water. This time he gave everyone a moment to think before pointing his palm at the other fruit. Glow most of us expected him to call on someone. But the next thing we knew, a thin glowing beam of water, hardly a millimeter in diameter appeared and connected to the fruit like a string. Crackle pop. The fruit exploded instantaneously, sending steaming chunks of fruit flying out towards us faster than we could react to. But the professor thankfully caught it all. Vroom. Most of us were simply frozen, myself included. W. Why did it react so violently? Even the 50-unit bolt he used on a fruit in his hand didn't react like that. The sight sparked my curiosity and made countless theories start blowing through my mind. The professor smiled, seeing me fall into thought. It seems that wasn't the reaction you all expected. He seemed proud to stump us, but especially so for me. Does anyone have any ideas? No one raised their hands this time. Except for me, at least. Yes, Cristallo. It was a bit of a shot in the dark. Is it because the water being used as the medium superheated and exploded inside of the fruit? I remember brother showing me what water can do when heated quickly in a confined space. But no matter how I wanted to twist it, I was clueless about why it happened so suddenly, 
especially when the water wasn't even boiling on its way to the fruit. That is indeed part of it. Great job. His praise was something I would usually love, but this time it fell on deaf ears. I wanted to know why it happened. But unfortunately that desire was left to fester. For homework today, I would like you all to write your own theories for what you believe happened. Don't feel bad if what you write sounds like nonsense or if you know it isn't right. Something is always better than nothing. He smiled, seeing the students' mix of eager and disappointed looks. Ha ha, I will give a bag of stoneberries to those with good answers, so think hard. Tomorrow, we will discuss your theories and eventually go over what exactly happened. Until then, you are all dismissed. As everyone started getting up to leave, theories continued to rip through my mind, and my gaze slowly turned to the floor. The water wouldn't gain enough heat to explode when hitting the fruit on its own so it must have to do with the lightning magic. So think, what did the lightning do to cause that? But I was eventually pulled out of that trance. Tap tap HM? Quickly noticing the room was already mostly empty. I looked to the side and met eyes with Farah. She was wearing her usual bright smile. Hee hee, I told the professor to bring us some of that velvet cake we saw in the bakery after classes the other day. My train of thought immediately shifted as my mouth started to water. Really? He said he would bring that? That tiny little cake was almost 50 gold. Yeah, he said he would buy it for us to share since we have improved so much recently. I guess it makes sense that he would be wealthy. But isn't he spoiling us a bit too much? Classes started back up on the winter solstice, which was just a couple weeks ago, and our rune and magic theory professor was switched out to this man, so he was still new despite having won over the hearts of his students already. Of course, I had no reason to complain. He was especially knowledgeable on everything he taught, and his teaching methods were extremely involved, especially when compared to our previous professor. He really knows how to grab everyone's attention too. Finally getting up, I followed Ftera out of class and into the colossal hallway that could easily fit an ancient. It was time to head to our next class, but I wasn't looking forward to it. Do you think she will actually tell my parents if I skip class again? Uh, yeah? Tara looked at me like I was crazy. Has she ever not followed through with one of her threats? Ha! Huh. Our history professor was truly like a witch out of some story. Having already learned a lot of history from mother, ever since I joined her class, I had to constantly correct her on topics she was teaching. And it wasn't just small details either. Even some of the significant events she tried to tell us about were plainly wrong, and she would never admit anything. To an extent, I feel like she is lying on purpose. But that was a bit too much of an assumption. I just wish I could tell the headmaster. Ah, right? Where did you say he went? Saratha. I don't know why he went there, but he left about a month ago. Finally turning into a different hallway, we eventually made it to the room. Ha! Huh. Click the moment the door opened. I could feel her gaze. Maybe I should tell mother about her. Quickly making it to my seat, I chatted with Tara for a bit, and the class eventually started. But it was nothing short of excruciating. As usual, the professor said countless things that were wrong, and no matter how much I wanted to ignore it, some of the statements were simply outlandish. She, of course, made it difficult for me to say anything regarding what she was teaching and gave me her usual warnings about interrupting but I no longer cared. The moment the headmaster returns, I will just report her. But as I went to leave the class after being dismissed, she stopped me. Cristallo. Her annoyed look was much more visible than normal. If you are going to continue to correct me, even after my warnings, you are welcome to not attend. However, you must pass this class to graduate, so think carefully. Our next test is in seven days. Seeing my expression as the professor turned back to the papers on her desk, Ftera was quick to drag me out of the room. Are you crazy? She was always the one to try and mitigate things since she was one of the professor's favorites. No matter who your parents are, they won't be able to save you if you get expelled. Why don't you just try and learn from her? She wouldn't be a professor here in Atlas if she was stupid. Ha! Huh. I couldn't deny her. That fact was actually why I initially doubted what I remembered from mother's lessons when first attending history class, as well as why I was always the only one to speak up about what she taught. But I can't let her just get away with it. I'm not sure how she got this position, 
but she clearly isn't worthy of it. It was at that moment that I finally steeled my will to ask mother if she could do something, even though I believed it went against our family rule about relying on the family name. However, mother's reaction wasn't exactly what I expected. Your professor told you what? Her calm expression morphed with shock the instant I mentioned what the professor was trying to tell us a few days prior. She said that Bahamut left Heramanichikos to die because he believed the way she ruled was. Bloodlust immediately appeared in mother's gaze, making me nervous to say anything more, but she instead just looked at father with a gaze of fire. However, he looked just as upset. It seems I need to have a talk with the vice headmaster about who they have chosen to be a professor. I agree. I will contact Miles. Mother's expression softened, an intent to kill vanished the instant she turned back to me. Sweetie, you said your friend's name was Tara, right? Why don't you bring her here after your rune and magic theory class? While your father and I look into this, I will give you two lessons. I immediately nodded as my nervousness was replaced with excitement. Okay. For now, Osto, you know who to visit. I will send a letter to Mother, and Miles, as well as try to reach the headmaster. Father quickly nodded in agreement. All right, I will be back soon. He quickly left the room and headed to the door. But although we expected to hear him throw the door open and slam it behind himself, we heard nothing after he opened it. Huh? What is he doing? Read up to five chapters ahead of schedule on my Patreon. In case embedded link doesn't work https colon slash slash www.patreon.com slash tdod also if you are looking for a new story check out my new novel the systems harvester chapter 275 home sweet home early evening midwinter atlas bahamut click hearing the lock get undone i stepped back from the door but instead of seeing a maid as it swung open I found myself looking down at a white dragon almost 10 meters shorter than me, to think I grew this much. We were basically eye to eye before I left. I subconsciously lowered my head and softened my posture upon seeing him. H. Hey, father, have you been well? His expression was a mix of confusion, awe, and worry. V. Vasilius? Yuri already back? Nothing serious happened, right? I immediately clammed up a bit. A few things happened, but that's not why I'm here. I don't think I'll be able to avoid the issue this time, but that's for later. I just haven't been able to keep in touch over the last few years, so I decided to come back and visit for a while. His worry quickly started to fade as he let out a deep breath. Phew. However, his worry wasn't the one I was anxious about. Honey? Is everything ALR as mother rounded the corner? She completely froze in place with an expression remarkably similar to father's before bolting to the door and quickly inspecting. Me. Fush Vasilius? What are you doing here? Are you alright? Are you in trouble? Do you need help? Her worry hit me in the face like a train, forcing me to quickly pull her in for a hug. I'm alright, mother. You don't need to worry so much. Her worry slowly started to dissipate with my affirmation, but her heart was still racing. What do you mean, not worry? When children leave the nest, it's for at least ten years. If they come back sooner, it either means something bad happened, or they struggled to adapt to living on their own. And I know you aren't the latter. Her worry was definitely warranted, especially with the condition of my aura and slightly visible exhaustion. But I can't let her worry like that. I just came back because I missed you all. Is that such a bad thing? Her face quickly morphed as if she wanted to cry before shoving it into me and speaking in a hushed tone. And no. Thank you for coming back. A warm feeling arose in my chest immediately. Of course, it's good to be back. There was a short moment of silence, not just among us but also the maids, as we stood in the doorway and enjoyed our reunion. However, after a moment, I decided to ask something weighing on my mind. So, where is Cristallo? It was pretty unusual that she didn't charge into me the moment I came through the door. Mother slowly pulled away again, clearly still emotional. Since the incident with Eugene and Basilia, she is cautious whenever someone visits. However, she slowly backed up with a more purely joyful expression coming to her face. She will definitely freak out when she sees that it's you. I smiled just thinking about it. What makes you say that? She took you leaving the nest harder than anyone. It even made it hard for her to make friends when she first started going to the academy. Suddenly feeling a bit guilty, 
I followed mother into the estate, away from the peeping eyes of the people. I knew she would take it a bit hard, but I didn't think it would be that bad. As we started walking, mother slowed down to speak with me. I don't think I ever told you, but when you had one of your first dragon sleeps, Cristallo stuck to you like a magnet. Whenever I told her she needed to sleep on her own, she would refuse and crawl up next to you like Elio's does. Her familiar warm expression quickly started to return as she glanced back at Elio's, who was already napping. Haha, is that so? I remember her crawling up next to me some when we were young, but to think it started that early on. My smile slowly grew. We will be turning 16 soon. Maybe I will finally be able to have some fun teasing her. However, all hopes of me getting some fun out of teasing her was tossed out of the window mere moments later. Coming up on what I assumed was the living room, mother walked ahead and opened the door. Sweetie, Vasilius came. Fwoosh a white blur blasted through the door immediately before leaping off the ground and heading straight for my face. Clack. The next thing I knew, I had a 16 meter tall dragon hanging off my head, glaring at me with a gleam in her eyes and a wagging tail. I wanted to laugh, but something about the look in her eyes made me hesitant. That was when she broke the silence. You have to take me with you next time you leave. She spoke without the slightest trace of sarcasm in her voice. Haha, ha, I will be staying here for a while, don't worry. If I need to go by Saratha, however, I can show you around. I should see if I can get her to form a connection with Leaf. Right. You have to tell me all about your trip too, and give me science lessons again, or else I won't forgive you for leaving. She proudly swung herself around to perch herself on my head with a smug look. Being a bit over double her height, I was just big enough for her to lay there with her legs hanging off. Ha, huh, all right. Anything else you would like? Hmm. She paused with a contemplating look for a moment before having a light bulb go off and hanging her head down to look me in the eyes. Come to the academy with me tomorrow. Her expression was difficult to refuse. But I can't just yet. Okay. But I'm not sure I can do tomorrow. She immediately pouted. Hmph. Ha ha. I just need to recover some mana and rest a bit before I can go with you. But I promise I will go with you after that. I do have something that can hopefully compensate for that though. Her expression flipped instantly. A gift? I quickly moved it over to her with my aura. But she obviously didn't recognize it. Huh? What? Is this? Both mother and father looked a bit confused as well. That's called a microscope. It took a while to make and get working correctly. But it was as good as it gets before moving to an electron microscope. A microscope? I proudly nodded. Here, look at this. I quickly took out a slide of two incredibly thin pieces of glass with a tiny bit of water between them and slipped it into the lower power lens. Change to your humanoid form and look through those two things at the top. Flash she did as I said without any hesitation at all. What the? What are these things? Her reaction was beautiful. Those are called bacteria. They are essentially tiny little creatures that live anywhere and everywhere that are so small you can't see them with just your eyes. While it was true that you could see them with aura, they were typically on a scale that people would overlook, so while their existence was known, it wasn't common knowledge among anyone but old elders and ancients. However, to someone young like Cristallo, it would be like becoming told a whole different world existed right under their feet. Whoa! She pulled her eyes away for a moment to look at the slide normally. The water looks so clear though. If there are really that many little creatures, why are they not visible, even as a blur? Because they are so small that light can pass straight through them. There was a short moment of silence as she looked back through the lens. Wuh. My smile quickly widened, seeing her enjoying it so much before giving her a basic rundown of how it worked and how to use and change the slides to look at almost anything she wanted to. However, by the time I finished explaining it, I had managed to pique mother's curiosity and got tasked with making another one for her. Of course I didn't mind, but one thing quickly led to another after that. Before I knew it, the question I knew was inevitable finally came. Father was pretty blunt about it too. You keep mentioning that you need to replenish your mana, but no matter how I look at it, your aura doesn't exactly seem all that low. Ha! Huh. I guess I'll need to tell them soon anyway. I quickly shook my head. My reserve has grown immensely over the last few years. 
I have actually been narrowly avoiding mana exhaustion for a few days now. Mother tensed up immediately, clearly putting two and two together. If your reserve has grown that much, then what did you do that drained it? She looked extremely anxious. Well, it's a long story, but I guess I should start by saying, I am basically the ruler of Saratha now. Cristallo immediately looked up from the microscope and gave me a confused look. Didn't the Serathian gods return during the recent prayer? I was quick to nod. What would you say if I told you that your brother is their god? Her eyes lit up like a beacon. But mother still wore a worried look. So you were the one to kill the apostles? My nod told a thousand words. But it's not what you think. I hesitated for a moment to think of how to explain it before deciding to just go for it. The apostles that I killed were ones who got possessed by a human god named Magni. I couldn't. Mother's face turned pale before I could even finish. Don't tell me. I moved over to her in a flash. Don't worry. I didn't get marked or anything. The human gods still have no idea what or who I am. She didn't believe me though. As sweetie. T. That is impossible if the god was there themselves. Seeing such doubt and worry, I could no longer beat around the bush. It is possible because I killed him before he could escape. Silence filled the room instantly, freezing everyone in place and making their faces pale. My statement to Cristallo about being a god was suddenly no longer a child's exaggeration. Cristallo was actually the only one who didn't wear a look of disbelief or fear, even among the maids. She just looked at me with an unfathomably prideful light in her eyes. Ha! Huh. At least I avoided worrying her. Read up to five chapters ahead of schedule on my Patreon. In case embedded link doesn't work, https colon slash slash www.patreon.com slash tdod. Also if you are looking for a new story, check out my new novel, The Systems Harvester. Welp, my power is out. Hey guys, just wanted to let you guys know the chapter tomorrow will come out on Saturday. Although I'm not sure how, my power went out without there being a storm and it's been several hours, so I haven't been able to get the work done that I needed to and will need to push things back. In any case, I apologize for the sudden announcement and hope to see you all Saturday. If you don't want to wait, feel free to go to my Patreon. In case embedded link doesn't work, https colon slash slash www.patreon.com slash tdod. Also if you are looking for a new story, check out my new novel the system's harvester.